Um, what I want to do now is there's a couple parts left to my presentation. Actually, we're doing okay on time. I'll, in, in, my my uh, thought on that may change in my half an hour. Um, I'm going to talk for about five minutes on mobile caching, because I deferred this earlier, right? So I want to talk about some caveats when it comes to mobile caching. In the mobile tracks today, you'll hear a lot about this stuff. So I'm going to not necessarily repeat some of the things that you may hear. I'll add a couple of new things and make sure that you know of the, of the, the important parts, the asterisks that you should keep um, track of. I'm not going to insult your intelligence and state the obvious, even though I just did. So I'm not going to prove to you that caching is good. Caching is good, clearly. If I had a waterfall that looked like this, and I'm using PCAP too hard here, and I did terrible, terrible, terrible caching, my repeat view will look like this. Notice that that's just basically a cut and paste job. Look at that, huh? Look like at that. Nice. If I did a little bit moderate caching, so I added some basic headers and caused validation calls rather than full blown caching, I'll get something like this, where you see all these things which are validations. What's a validation? The browser, the HTTP agent, goes back home and says, hey, I have a thing, can I use it? And all these three or fours are the server saying, yeah, you can use it. But this is a cell network, so the go and come back is like, oh no, how far that's going. So that is better. Notice that little, there's a timer here that got one like 15 to like nine. It's better, but it's not as good as this, which is good, good, wholesome, old school um, caching. And obviously, we got a better time. So it was like 15 seconds, we're in five seconds. This is a repeat view. So given that, which is something we've established quite a, for quite some time now in the performance community, mobile caching is a little bit different because um, there's caveats and new things. So not only is it an area where it makes you go, damn, that's not cool. It's also an area that says, damn, that's kind of cool. So I'm going to talk about those really quickly, and I'm going to give you a lot of things to read if you're interested in this later so you can see some of this research for yourself. So there's two core issues when we talk about mobile caching. It's where do we put it, where we put, where we put these objects that we want to cache, and what's the size of that cache. Those are the two main issues that we talk about. When it comes to the size of the cache, there's some good studies out there. Uh, I found a really good study from the Wink guys. Guy from Blaze also has a good blog post on it. And the, there's a YUI um, study on the size of mobile caches here. There's also the question of how big can those files be. Steve and YUI did some good work on this as well. I highly recommend all these things for you guys to read. This is good reading. The summary, the general consensus, Actually, I'm going to say general because I'm not sure there's actually consensus because this is kind of an unknown, is if you summarize, mobile caches on these platforms are small. So that's a summary. You, you'll hear, somewhere you'll read that it's 5 megs. Somewhere you'll read that it's 9 megs. Somewhere you'll read that it's 6 megs. It doesn't matter. It's small. That's the key takeaway. We know on the Android platform, it's quite small. Notice that that, that site that we just optimized, that, that really bad version of the O'Reilly set was a meg, right? That's a shared cache. Right? So that's not good. It's much bigger on iOS. I actually have um, another slide later in the presentation where I talk about um, some behavioral patterns um, with the cache. I'm saving this for a little bit later when I talk about some lessons learned. We definitely need to think about the total cache size, the objects that go inside the cache, and is the cache different for base pages, HTML content. <clears throat> we know that user behavior may affect the cache. We heard earlier today that um, there's an iOS cache that's not persistent. Uh, that it gets wiped out. Those things may happen. I'm, I actually found something a bit different, but you, just, the, just the notion that there isn't, there's some disparity and there's enough facts on it is interesting enough in itself. We know that things are getting better, but they're not really where they were in, um, uh, where they are in the desktop world. I did a couple little tests extra myself. There's a lot of good information on this page. I was curious about a couple of things myself, so I did a little bit more um, research. I found that Opera and Firefox and Gingerbread gave me about twice as much cache. Um, which was interesting to me because they're not actually using the, the cache in the app. They're using a da data storage. Come back. Here you are. Um, and the stock browser in ICS is going up to 25 megs, which was also nice to see. I found a great article from Tony Gentlecore on um, Chrome uh, and the, the way it uses and it provisions the cache. It's actually dynamic. So based on what the resources are available on your phone, Chrome will configure itself um, uh, to, for a big, big, big cache. So um, there, there's some differences there, which is interesting. It's moving in the right direction. I actually, from the test that I ran, because I was really curious about this stuff, I actually saw very, very aggressive caching. So when there was room to cache, the things cached, which was actually nice to see. Problem is there's not that much room. Just as a point of reference, here's how big caches are on desktop browsers. 
So on IE, the default is um, up to 250, but you can tweak that. Chrome, um, I just spot checked a couple, couple of computers. Um, it's 300 megs, Firefox was big. Steve has a great link for you to go and crowdsource this information and tell him how big your cache is and how much of it is used. Um, these numbers were sort of in line with that. Um, so caching, and when I say caching, I mean HTTP object caching in mobile devices is kind of like a weird area where I don't think we can take as many liberties as we did with desktop caches. Enter HTML5's local storage. What's local storage? For those of you that don't know, it's part of the, the web storage spec. It's essentially a key value store that is stored in the browser, um, in, the, in, the, in the phone. It's per domain, so it's dedicated for the domain. We don't have this for HTTP caches. HTTP caches are shared uh, resources, right? We get about two and a half megs of space. It's per domain, so if you're going to be using the local cache, you have a lot of control over it. And there's a site you can go test it. Where's my thing? There's a site you can go test it, see how big uh, local storage is on your phone. And the coolest part of it is that it's programmable. It's part, there's JavaScript calls to it. It's fully, fully programmable. You have control over that key value pair. This is something we do not have with HTTP object caches. HTTP object caches are basically this like totally unknown entity that the browser uses as a resource. This is a programmable entity, which is kind of exciting. Just to give you a sort of a hint clue as to what this thing looks like. This is using the Storager bookmarklet, which is part of Steve's super bookmarklet, which I highly recommend you guys use. This is what Bing's local storage looks like. I just went on a phone, went to the Bing site, and looked at the local storage. Here are all the key value pairs they have. <clears throat> local storage gives us a great opportunity for um, caching. So you can use local storage for anything. I've seen articles on how you could use it for cookie storage, all sorts of um, key value pairs that you can store in there. You can also use it for objects. How does that work? You put program programmatically, you can put objects into local storage, and you have access to them, again, programmatically, which is great. At any given time, you can know what the state of the local storage is, what's in there, uh, how long things have been in there if you chose to code that in. <clears throat> it's programmable, which is great. It's a great storage for CSS files and JavaScript files, specifically if those are site-wide. And uh, we're also, we have a, in our service, we have a tweakable sort of opportunity to, to add images in that mix as well, smaller images, because you want to be careful with that um, two and a half meg. So uh, we put images in there through data URIs. So that is an area where local storage is interesting, and it gives us brand new opportunities for programmable caching. Um, I've been part of the caching and HTTP world for a long time, and it's always been frustrating where I don't have any insight into what's happening inside my browser cache. I gotta tell you, man, this stuff is interesting because now we can do sorts of things that we couldn't do before. So that's really interesting to me. Um, now, I am not proud of it. Um, okay, I'm a little proud of it. But earlier I lied. There may be another site that we can accelerate. There may be. Um, look, I decided, what I decided to do when I first looked at the site, I was like, this is a great lean site. Uh, nothing I can do with this. This is, this is very, very lean. But what I wanted to do, and um, this approach is actually a little bit different. What I wanted to do is I wanted to do acceleration of this site, but with a different eye. So this is not a brute force, let's get those numbers to get less and less and less and less. I'm gonna do this a little bit differently. Hopefully it'll be interesting. If it's not, well, it won't be the first uninteresting thing I've done today. Um, this is what it looks like. So even though the site is like this, or is it like that, this is what the waterfall looks like. I thought this was interesting. I didn't actually notice this the first time. I got curious. At, I'm not proud of the fact that I was bored and I did waterfalls, so that's, I, I have a life, sort of, sometimes. Um, I, I looked at the waterfall, and this was interesting to me, because even though the site is actually pretty lean when you look at it, that's the number of round trips that, take, that, uh, that need to happen before the onload event fires, and it starts rendering pretty late. Let's see what it looks like. Again, this is from a 3G phone in, um, in uh, Vancouver. So that's pretty simple, but I don't like the fact that it took six and a half seconds for me to see anything. So that wasn't interesting. So I did some further analysis. That's the waterfall, that's the site. The site's actually like that, right? So when you look at a site that's like that, it's interesting to notice that this is what's actually in the viewport. 
So I don't know, I can't do the ratios in my head. What is that? One, two, three plus full scrolls are actually hidden to me. So this was interesting to me, that I need that waterfall for this whole thing, but I'm actually only visually engaging with this piece. That was really interesting. Now, I have tools at my disposal that let me play with this. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is not necessarily very simple, but it's not very difficult either. And I encourage you, come talk to me afterwards if you want to learn some, about some of this stuff, and we can um, talk about how you can try these things. So here's what I did. Since most of the images, actually almost all of the images except two, are not in the immediate viewport, I thought that was interesting. So I'm like, I want to do something there. Um, there's lots of round trips that are blocking start render, and I'm going to accelerate this time with an eye towards making the page faster, a uh, snappier, and improving. I'm going to focus on the start render time. I want the videos to get really, really good. So I'm willing to sacrifice things like on load time, but I want the videos to be good. So here's what I did. Remember we talked about deferral of those third party um, calls when we were doing the O'Reilly site? Well, third parties aren't the only things you can defer. You can defer third parties, but you can also defer images. So since most of these images were not in my immediate viewport, I'm like, I decided to totally defer the images, except the two that I need to see, which is the stuff up top. Actually, there's more than two. There's some stuff happening under the menu bar. <clears throat> so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to defer all the images and still do the third party stuff like before. I'll add in some very basic uh, FEO like before. Um, and I hope to see better start render times, better start render times. Um, and better document complete time. And most importantly, because this is what I'm going for, I hope to see a faster and snappier page. So let's cook. And here's what my before and after waterfalls look like. Now, this is interesting. If you're standing in the back of the room, these don't actually look all that different. What's interesting is these lines moved. The start render time and doc complete time, and I said I'm going to focus on start render, so that's the one I'm going to focus on. That moved from 6.2 seconds to 2.1. The number of round trips hasn't changed all that much. I did min uh, reduce the number of bytes a little bit. That's fair. But notice that these lines moved. I did full-blown images for all these guys right here, which moved from the left to the right, are images. And that's all the stuff that wasn't available in the viewport. So look at what I'm doing post on load there. There's a lot of activity happening post on load. That's because I, I deferred all those images. The impact on my performance metrics is interesting. I went from an on load time of 12 to 4. I know I said I, didn't fo I wouldn't focus on it, but it's there. So why don't we look at it? Um, my round trips to onload are less. My total round trips aren't necessarily that much less. There's a little bit of uh, um, consolidation there, tiny bit into uh, some inlining. Um, but the core issue is right there, and most importantly, right there. So let's see what this looks like. Boom. Right? Now, I did this. I know these are performance techniques that I'm using, but my, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a different lens on this one. It's not this brute force, move the lines, move the lines. It's a very functional acceleration. My site is only so much visible in the viewport. This is something that mobile enables us to do, right? It's only going to be visible so much. Why do I need all the stuff that's down here? I can actually defer that stuff. So that was, that was interesting. I thought this was an interesting way to do a little bit of acceleration. But since I'm going to do this one differently, I asked the question, what if I do less? So let's go back to this. That was the site before, right? This was my visible viewport. This is the stuff that I couldn't see because it was under the phone, right? I can't see it. I have to scroll. What if I let a scroll worth of stuff show up before the onload time? And again, I have a toolkit that lets me play with this stuff. So we, we do have a bunch of automation in what Strange Loop does with this stuff, but I was trying to be very specific in picking and choosing and doing something specific to this site, which is actually the lesson here. You have to do performance optimization, especially when it comes to functional stuff, specific to your site. So the idea here is, what if those images right there, I didn't defer fully? What if I made these guys available before on load? If my visual response, if my, if my page visually is kind of the same before and after, but that's not a terrible thing to do because it kind of makes me have one scroll worth of stuff available quicker, right? OK, so that's interesting. Let's cook. Let's see what happens. Before and after waterfalls. Almost identical, except these four guys that I moved from the right side of that blue line to the left side of that blue line. I don't know if you can see it, but these four images on the right waterfall are actually available two seconds before they were over here. So if that first scroll is pretty fast, those images are going to be available, and they're going to be there. 
my performance metrics, this is interesting actually. My performance metrics, I, hint, I actually paid a penalty in both. I got a little bit slower, a little bit slower in start render time, and I got about, what is that, half a second, more than half a second slower in on load time. Well, typically you'd say, oh my God, that your numbers moved to the wrong side. Don't do stuff like that. You want the numbers to be as low as possible. But do I? Do I, I say, with a really high-pitched voice, which I didn't know I had? Let's look at the video. OK. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit slower. But visually, you can argue that those are actually quite similar. And if it's important to me for, me for me to have that first scroll available, then this is not a bad idea, right? I've deferred less, so I've done some functional acceleration without blinders on. I've deferred less. I really haven't changed all that much with the visuals. I'm definitely faster from here to here, no questions there. And the result is not terrible. So it's interesting, this is a question. It's interesting to think about these things with a lens towards usability and functionality. That is an important part of performance optimization that we don't always talk about. And it's, I, I think it's important to have it in our radar. So it's not always about every metric. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, some of this stuff is actually programmatically available. Like you can figure out what's in the view, di viewport dynamically, do some fetching based on that. Um, there's some interesting things that you can do and actually automate. <clears throat> I'm going to do one last thing because I am a performance freak. Um, there is one thing that I noticed in this that could have gotten a little bit faster, so I'm going to zoom in. And you notice that I just don't like this. I just did not like that there's so many milliseconds paid in penalty right there. Notice that my time to first buy, uh, sorry, my connection time is about 200 milliseconds, but there's a penalty I'm paying for probably server processing time of, uh, for when I see the first byte of my response. So what I'm going to do on top of this, I'm going to layer in a little bit of HTML caching. So in front of the server, I'm going to cache the HTML. Now, this is complicated. I'm going to talk about some of the complications in a second. But in front, I'm going to layer in a little bit of, the, uh, of HTML caching. Hopefully, this will eliminate the server um, think time. Of course, it will eliminate the server think time because it will hide it. And I should see a faster start render time, hopefully. Let's cook it. I'm going to use this picture a second time because I like it. That's the before and after. And you'll notice that my time to first byte for the HTML got reduced significantly. And I see that my metrics got affected across the board, which is cool. And the question of what it looks like, I'm going to compare it to that second image deferral. Notice that it's snappier. It shows up faster. I don't incur the same server time, um, uh, server think time penalty that I incurred before. I'm gonna, about 20 minutes, so I'm going to rush through a little bit of this. <clears throat> Some caveats with HTML. HTML is dynamic. Sometimes it's dependent on the user agent. Actually, this particular site, the Velocity site, it's the same URL. Um, we don't have that re annoying redirect. It's the same URL that sends you a different um, HTML based on your user agent. That's cool. So because of that, caching HTML, you got to be a little bit careful because the content's changing based on the user agent. It's one of the reasons not a lot of people do HTML caching. So if you decide to do HTML caching, it needs to be granular. It needs to be a little bit smarter. And you want the time that HTML gets cached for to be very different than the time that you, you cache your static objects that are very rarely um, changing. I only have two sections left, so bear with me. We only have... We have 18 more minutes. We actually may get through this. Um, we haven't covered everything. Of course we haven't covered everything. If we covered everything, then that would be interesting. Um, what haven't we covered? We haven't talked about um, what happens. Uh, we've just made two pages faster. We haven't talked about uh, a user um, flowing through a site. We haven't talked about um, uh, a lot of nuances when it comes to performance of those individual pages. Uh, we haven't looked at the site holistically. Uh, we've looked, just looked at two pages. Let me give you an example. When I, when I go to the Velocity site, I'm going to go through. Like, I want this to be the, the, the interaction with, with me in the site. I go to the home page. I look at the schedule. I look at the, where the thing's at. Maybe I go register. That right there is the actual user interaction. Optimizing this is great, but I got to make sure every step of this is optimized. As a matter of fact, I may pay a penalty here and be okay with it if getting to this point becomes faster for the user. So this is a lens that's important. It's a complicated one, but it's an important one. What about other performance optimizations? Well, there's a bunch of stuff that you can't clearly see on a waterfall, so I left them out, but these are things that are available. 
and doable when it comes to performance uh, optimization. Click events, they dynamically get um, um, tr um, translated to touch events on your phone. So you can do that beforehand. Sometimes you pay a penalty in that conversion on the phone itself, which is doing the, the converting. Uh, that penalty is something that you can uh, bypass by doing the, the click events, to the touch events to start with. Smart usage of local storage. You can, because it's programmatic, uh, it's programmable, you can do smart things. When you come back to the site, you can make decisions based on what's in the local storage. That's an interesting area of opportunity. We talked about that redirect, which the Velocity site didn't have. Sometimes people redirect from their normal site to their mobile site. That's a round trip that needs to get incurred, so you got to want to get rid of that redirect. Um, 3G versus Wi-Fi, you can do different things when you see somebody coming in on Wi-Fi that you can do for uh, when they come in on 3G. You can do this actually programmatically on Android with a little call right there. So you can make those decisions dynamically. That's an interesting um, area of opportunity. There's also a bunch of uh, uh, operational improvements that you can make. Uh, you know that URL bar on top of the, the, the page as you scroll to a page, as you, as you browse to a page? Well, there's ways to hide that automatically. There's mobile-specific meta tags. I'm not going to get into a lot of these things. There's a great presentation from Max from last year's Velocity that talks about some of these very operational and functional improvements that you can make on your site. The point here is to think mobile. Always think mobile. If you're m making a site that you expect to have consumed by mobile users, think mobile. There's very, very good and mobile specific things that you can do to make it functional, operational, and faster. That what I showed you here was just an example of those things. But um, which one of those you can apply to your site and which one of those matter to you is going to be up to you um, looking at your site. Um, for the last five minutes, maybe eight, then I'd like to have some room for questions, but I know that's ambitious. Um, I'm going to go through some lessons learned from the field. Now, some of this stuff you've heard before, uh, a couple of these things may be new. I, haven't, I, I didn't know about them. Uh, maybe you did or have heard about them here already. Um, I'm just going to share some of these lessons, some things that you guys should know. When you're looking at mobile performance, there's things you should know, a little bit different than what happens on um, uh, desktop browsers. So these are lessons that we've learned, and we're continuing to learn these things, and I'll hopefully have more of this stuff as um, time goes. I'm going to talk about mobile cache behavior really quick this way. <clears throat> now, I know uh, you want me to go through every single one of those cells one by one and narrate it to you because you, you like this so much. You want to stay until 8 o'clock. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to publish this afterwards. Here's what I did. I couldn't find the answer to these questions. There's a lot of stuff out there on, um, on what, how caches sizes and things like this. What I couldn't find is behavioral patterns. So what I did is I loaded a um, mobile cache with two megs of images, just images. So if there's nuances in whether it's JavaScript, HTML, blah, 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 I didn't test those. So I'm perfectly aware of this. And I did what I did was, both on Android and iOS, I did different things after I put that stuff into the cache. So I don't know. I opened a new window. I can't see from here. I opened a new window. I exited the browser. I killed the process. I did a reload. I clicked on the URL and hit go, all these things. <clears throat> and I observed behavior based on how those things went into the cache to start with. And by that, I mean the headers. So the various caching headers that were on there. This is what I saw. Now, you guys can, uh, we can talk about this offline. I don't want to go through every one of those cells. There are a couple of interesting things, though. Look at this here. Where is it? Make sure I get it right. Look at this one here. Android cached, this is a gingerbread device. Android cached a whole bunch of stuff when I had no caching headers whatsoever. But the moment I added last modified, it did conditional requests. I thought that was interesting. That was different than what I would expect, which is more along the lines of this right here. This stuff was interesting. They're all conditional requests. So this told me that a reload, or like a refresh, should refresh and validate with the website, which is kind of what I would expect. So that was kind of cool. Anyway, I'm going to post this later. Um, um, go through this as you wish. This is earlier on, and I've heard this before, so I'm, I'm a, I just want to make sure you guys know that this is not necessarily a proven science. We're all trying to figure this out because the information isn't necessarily out there. Um, that the iOS cache isn't persistent. I actually saw something different, but that could be a function of my two megs of images. So I don't know. Uh, more research is necessary. Um, pipelining. Uh, anybody not know what, actually, anybody know what pipelining is? Let's do it this way. OK, that's good. OK, quick review. Normal HTTP is like this. You have a TCP connection. You make a request, you get a response. You make a request, you get a response. It needs to be serial like this. If you're a packet 
person like me, this is what it looks like. There it is. Request, response. Request, response. Request, response. Pipelining says, hey, I have an open connection. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a bunch of gets at once, and then you can respond to me, but there's got to be an order. Uh, they have to come back in the same order that I made the request for you. So if you're a packet guy like me, it kind of looks like this. Watch this. That's a request. That's a response. Then this request, which I've highlighted, watch this, inside the packet, that's one and two HTTP requests in the same packet. And that's a third one that follows. And I get two of the responses. I send a fourth, and I get the other two. This is what pipelining looks like on the wire, if you're curious and put, like, like packet captures like me. This means packet drops, which happens on cell networks, make you um, sad. And you can see that in waterfalls. Check this out. This too, I, and I, I did a this, uh, check on the um, PCAP files for these. That's a drop packet. When that packet gets dropped, all the requests suffer. In the old way, if a, pa if a request packet gets dropped, it's that one request that suffers. In the new way, in the pipelining way, when a packet gets dropped, that's, that's carrying one, sorry, two, three, or maybe more uh, requests, they all suffer. You actually see that in the waterfall. These two right here are packets being dropped that are pipeline packets. So you get to see that, and you pay that penalty. This one actually stopped on load time. So it's something you got to be careful about. Guy has a great article on this. I encourage you guys to read it on the behavior and, and the way browsers sort of um, pick what to pipeline and what not to pipeline. We had some interesting pipeline information earlier um, from Pat and Matt in the session next door. Look at that presentation as well. Um, this, I didn't find anything about this um, anywhere, so this may be um, new. <clears throat> I want to talk about TCP windows for a second. Um, anybody know what a congestion window is? And keep it up if you know what TCP windows in general are. OK, great. Uh, so here's the way it works. TCP, as we know, starts a connection with a three-way handshake, since in ACK, ACK, there's a get. <clears throat> now, um, we call this the init C window, the initial congestion window, uh, which is the send window for this side's TCP. <clears throat> Not knowing anything about this TCP connection that I'm about to partake in, I have to make a guess as to how many packets is OK for me to put on the network. OK, that's my first guess, and that's why it's called an init C window. Here's an example of what that looks like with six. So I have the request come in, and I say, I know nothing about this connection. I'm going to send you six packets. Vo voila. Six packets. Okay, I'm killing the battery on this thing. Now, well-known performance uh, pract uh, best practice to increase your C wind when in, you're in at C wind at the home base, so at the origin. Google recommends 10, actually. Actually, I, think, I believe the Google website's 10, and Speedy uses 10. <clears throat> so this is awesome. High-performance proxies, load balancers, CDNs use um, higher C winds than uh, caches do, uh, than the default of two or three. There's a great article from the CDN Planet guys on what the observed C wind is on CDN networks. So that's great. Um, and init C wind is only that first set of packets that you send. After that, it's slow start and congestion algorithms that govern what your send window is. But it's a little bit more complicated when a sender needs to figure out how many packets to send because the formula is based on two things. Actually, the symbol, I'm simplifying this a little bit. It's based on two things. It's the algorithm that you're in, so how much you think you need to send, coupled with what the other side tells you it can receive. So in, in reality, in the simplified formula, it's the minimum of what your C wind is, something you've calculated internally based on algorithms, and what the other side's told you it can receive. The other side tells you this in TCP packets. It's the receive window. When I learned TCP, actually, I'd learn more about receive windows than I did in send windows, because you see it in the packets. To make things difficult for us, receive windows are transmitted in bytes, and transmit windows, congestion windows, are actually configured in segments. So assuming full segment size, which in Ethernet is 1,460 bytes, if a host opens a connection to me and advertises a window size of 2920, which is two full segments, even if my init C wind is six, I can't send it six, because it's told me that I can only send it two. I can send it two, and I have to wait for a response, an acknowledgment from the other side before I can send it more. So it's the minimum of what the other side tells me and what I think I can send. That's interesting because this is dependent on the host stack, right? So here's a couple of examples from Windows. I'm outside the mobile world for a second. I need you, Pointer. 
that thing up there, I, you can't, oh, I have a mouse. This guy, that's the receive window that my Windows host um, has advertised when it opens the connection. The actual window that matters is actually the one down here, which is the window it gives me when it does the HTTP request, which is the last receive window I hear from the other side. Here's another window host down here. Now, what does this look like in the mobile world? For the iPhone and iPad, I saw that in its, uh, or the receive window is about 65K. Actually, that's when the connection starts down here. When the, when the request is sent right here, I see that it's actually quite high. So it's allowing me, it's allowing the server to send a lot of packets. Now, 131K is actually many, 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 many segments. So when you do the min formula, the, the, C win, the init C window of the sender actually ends up winning. What's interesting is what happens with Android and Gingerbread. Android and Gingerbread are based on the, um, Android Gingerbread is based on the uh, version two of the kernel. Version two of the kernel, this happens if you guys are Linux users, desktop users, if you're using version two of the kernel, the default receive window is 5,800 bytes. That's four segments. So even if you're going to a site that has great optimization happening at origin with cool load balancers or proxies that have huge C wins, they're not gonna be able to send it to you because you have told them you can only receive four segments. Fortunately, ICS, which is based on version three of the kernel, ups this to 14600, which is 10 max MSS windows. This was interesting to me. I, I found nothing like this, and I actually accidentally happened to see it. <clears throat> so what this means is on a gingerbread phone, even if you go to a very, very optimized, like Google, site that has a high uh, in each sequence, um, you're not going to be able to take advantage of that, and the site isn't going to be able to send you as many packets as you want. So it's still a very good idea to, um, to have large C wins if you're hosting a site. I, this is by no means saying don't do that, you gotta do that, but it's important to know um, what is happening underneath. The movement uh, in ICS to 10 times maximum MSS is great. Another great article from the CDM Planet guys about how those receive windows uh, work and what the common settings are across the different stacks. Last and not least, the sleeping radios, I'm not gonna get into this much. Uh, if you guys were in the session that Pat and Matt had earlier, um, the cell phone and the tower uh, communicate through the radio channel, and if there's idle, connect, uh, there's idle activity, if there's idleness in the activity, if there's no activity, um, the, the sort of connection goes to sleep a little bit, and that's to save you battery. It's actually initiated from the tower side. It saves you battery. There's a great article from Steve uh, on this, and Steve offers a way to measure what the penalty is that you pay with your carrier. What I noticed is that I actually saw this in testing, this affected testing for me. So check this out. These are two runs for the same test from the webpage test client, and that particular client at that time happened to run into some inactivity between runs. Now I actually noticed that right there. That's the thing, that's the guy being asleep. So that's it waking up. So this is interesting, and the point here is to be aware of this when you're doing measurements, when you're doing testing, and um, when you're um, trying to figure out um, what's going on when you see this magical, weird two-second thing show up. I call it a two-second thing, but I think it varies based on um, carrier. That's actually, I was, uh, once I got here, <laughs> I got here in the presentation, I'm like, holy crap, man, that's a lot of slides. So I, the fact that I got here is actually pretty cool. Um, quick summary, very, very, very quick. Um, performance matters. Uh, I hope you know that by now. It's important. It's a little bit different in the mobile world. It can be a little bit frustrating when it comes to the measurement tools because they're not all there, but they're getting there. Uh, they're getting better. I love what's happening with web page test. Like always, I love what's happening with web page test. It's giving us a great tool. It's going to keep getting better. So don't give up if mobile performance is important to you. Um, keep measuring. Um, and um, those of us who are interested or used to testing on desktop, uh, the gotchas and the lessons that we're learning from the mobile world are valuable ones. And I actually think they're interesting and exciting because I get to do some of the stuff again with a new canvas. So that's really interesting. Uh, before I let you guys go, uh, one of those sites will have um, a, a link to this uh, presentation. So if you're interested in some of this, want to do some further reading, so one of those sites will have a link to it. Uh, I have office hours at 2.30 on Wednesday. I actually don't know what that means, but I think it means I stand somewhere and you can come and talk to me. You can come and talk to me anytime. You don't have to wait for that. 
Um, so if you want to talk about any of the stuff that, that uh, I talked about here, come there um, and talk to me. If I can ask you a favor now, here's what we're going to do. You need to get off the Wi-Fi network. So this, you're going to give me data for that CDN thing that I talked about earlier. Okay? If you want to participate, I need you to get off the Wi-Fi network. So if you're on the Wi-Fi network, you're going to screw it up. Don't screw it up. On the 3G, 4G, whatever cell network that you have, and if you're roaming, it would be that network, and thank you for doing this if you're roaming, go to that link, bit.ly's velocity CDN test, all one word. What you're going to get is you're going to get a little form. If you're in US and Canada, in the first box, put your city, your area code, some unique number of characters that determines what your home network is, what your home area is. So if you're down here, you've, you've traveled here from Chicago, put your Chicago area code or ORD in there and put your carrier right there. If you're international, give me something about maybe the airport you're near, something that'll, that'll show me what the city is, that your home city is. Don't put Santa Clara. I know you're in Santa Clara. I need to know where your home network is and your carrier and just hit submit. That's all you got to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to collect a whole bunch of data. This tells me where your CDN query is coming from. So it's actually a complicated setup because it involves DNS. So I need to catch that thing. It's, 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 it was complicated. Um, and if enough of you do this and we have enough data, we can draw some conclusions. I'll make sure Josh blogs about these findings. Uh, I appreciate it. This could be really interesting and hopefully it'll help us answer um, some of the questions. Now, at one hour, 29 minutes and 57 seconds, I have a second for questions. No, I don't have any, I don't have any time for questions. Um, we can do a couple, can we? That's very kind. I've been told that we cannot do any questions, but I promise you I'll stand right up here, and if you have any questions, come to me, and we will talk about that together. Thank you very much.